Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this special EMEA edition of the Tripwire Threat Intelligence University, entitled Threat Intelligence Fundamentals. I'm Paul Eden, Director of International Customer and Professional Services here at Tripwire, and I will be your host for today. We have a full program with some great presentations lined up for you. First, I'll go over the agenda for today's Threat Intelligence University, and then I'll kick things off with the first presentation of the day. Before we start, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. The audio portion of the presentation will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume settings on your computer, and your headset to ensure that A, they're turned on, and B, that it's at an audible level. You can click on the expand rectangle on the right top corner of the slide deck area to enlarge the slides. If you are not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing the browser. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers all common technical issues. A link to the on-demand version of this event will be sent out. If you would like documentation for CPE credits, please respond to that email. OK, let's get started. Here is our agenda for the day. I'm going to kick things off with a look at how to make threat intelligence really work. Then Lloyd Webb will share his thoughts on the internet security threat landscape and talk about some of the key countermeasures. Following this, we'll hear from Dean Ferrando, who will explain the benefits of going back to basics with golden builds. Next, Paul Norris will introduce Tripwire's Technology Alliance program and showcase some of Tripwire's latest integrations. Our last presenter will be Adam Shostak, author of Threat Modeling, Designing for Security, who will illustrate the importance of threat modeling in the most creative manner. You'll never look at Star Wars in the same way, I promise. Finally, I'll wrap up our event with a summary of today's takeaways and a few predictions for 2016 before we send you on your way. A few things to note. There is a lot to see in the virtual environment, so please make sure you discover all of the offerings. Check out our resource room, where we have a host of brochures and materials available for you to download to your briefcase. Currently, you're in the auditorium, which is where you'll be able to watch all of our presentations. Lastly, the first 100 people to take um, our survey in the coffee lounge will be entered into a prize draw to win an espresso coffee maker. Thank you for joining us today for Tripwise Threat Intelligence University. We hope you enjoy the event. So let me kick the presentations off with how to make threat intelligence really work. Over the past few years, I've worked with a number of Tripwire's larger customers around threat detection and the emergence of threat intelligence. Initially, a common starting point for any conversation would be a question somewhere along the lines of, do you have or receive any threat intelligence sources currently? If I asked this question today, people would look at me strangely. Threat intelligence is everywhere. Almost every organization will have multiple sources of inbound threat intelligence. There are open source feeds, granted, most provide data only, so you'll still need tools to be able to mine it for correlation analysis and visualization purposes. There's commercial vendors selling analysis. Tripwire work with a number of partners such as iSight, CrowdStrike, and Palo Alto who provide threat intelligence analysis. More recently, we've seen the emergence of information sharing analysis centers known as ISACs. There's the FSISAC. The financial services sector has been really leading this um, area of research. We've got the UK GovCISP. That's the Cyber Security Information Sharing Partnership, which was launched back in 2013. And as of June this year, they had over 1,000 member companies and almost 3,000 individual members. Other ISACs are starting to appear under the current CERT-CIS scheme, such as 
SCI Net, which is a Scottish cyber information network. There's the Odyssey Project for Yorkshire and Humberside Police, a project aimed at the NHS, and I believe the telecom sector also has a very large project up and running. As the requirements for threat intelligence grows, so does the number of sources trying to feed this requirement. We could easily spend all day reading intelligence reports from all of these sources, but unless we can make this intelligence actionable for our organization, then it's just more data clogging up our inbox. Okay, so with the appearance of all this threat intelligence, one would assume we'd be getting much smarter about what our adversaries are up to. Well, I'm not sure we're at that point yet where it's actually giving us the upper hand. But if you look at this slide, um, and I'll start with the largest number, as that's the one that most likely caught your eye. Last line, one of Tripwire's partners reported a 2,000% increase in evasive malware over the past 12 months. This is a new breed of weaponized attack that gets past our traditional controls such as antivirus. This malware is commonly used in what is now called the advanced attack. The other numbers really represent two sides of the same coin. On the one side, we have the average time taken by the majority of organizations to discover a breach, which is several weeks. And sources like Verizon Data Breach Report, Mandiant, and Solera put the average time to discover an advanced persistent threat at around 205 days. Mandiant actually suggested 229, but I've seen other reports from organizations suggesting as little as 80 or 90 days. Although there's a huge variation in the estimates, in reality, I think the message is more than clear. It takes us far too long. On the other side of the coin, we have our adversaries, who can take just minutes to infiltrate an organization and to start siphoning off data. The fact that a breach can linger undiscovered for such a long period of time just increases the risk of unrecoverable damage to an organization. Months to detect, minutes to infiltrate. This time gap is the challenge that organizations and the security industry are trying to address. So this time discrepancy is what at Tripwire we call the cyber threat gap. You may be familiar with terms like kill chain, which is another way of looking at this. It's all about reducing the time gaps that we see as being critical challenges for limiting the scope, impact, and cost of a breach. First, let's consider the detection gap. How long does it take you to detect a breach after it's actually occurred? So, would your business, do you think, be better or worse than the 205 days that the reports suggest? The types of questions we should ask ourselves here are, are we able to prioritize the most important alerts we receive? If not, your analysts are likely to be wasting many cycles plowing through thousands of alerts that are probably irrelevant to your organization. Do we have visibility into events of interest on our critical systems? You have to have carried out a detailed risk analysis to identify the critical assets. If you don't know what's important, how can you start to protect it? Do I trust the information I'm receiving or is it false positive prone? Whichever monitoring solution you've chosen, it must have been fine-tuned over a period of time to ensure you're only seeing real alerts of interest. And finally, when I get the first indication that something might be wrong, can I quickly drill down into the details and pivot to other sources of information to confirm the validity of the initial indication? Now let's look at the response gap. Now that we know we've been breached, what does our forensic investigation and incident response process look like? 
the maturity of the instant response tends to influence the response gap, which is the time between discovering a breach and remediating it. A lot of this time will be spent figuring out the scope of the breach. The questions you need to be asking here are, which systems have been affected? Because if you don't know which systems were affected, how can you effectively remediate them? What changed on these systems? You need to know what has been changed, put in place or removed if you are to truly understand the construction and impact of the attack. What systems do I trust? Well, if you can't identify which systems you can trust, then by default you don't trust any. And that's not a good place to be. Where are my baseline or control systems and how do I get a system back into a trusted state? You don't want to be rebuilding all of your systems from scratch. Keep your goal build secure and up to date. This will help shorten the time to recovery. The US State Department recently suffered an email attack. Four months later, it still hasn't been completely fixed. This is the perfect example of a response gap issue. Finally, let's look at the prevention gap. So you've fixed the issue at hand. How do you stop it from happening again? You need to address the root cause and identify the weaknesses in your systems, processes and controls that allowed the breach to occur. It's also worth trying to identify what prevented its rapid detection and remediation. Closing the prevention gap requires you have effective monitoring in place across your critical systems. As I said before, if you don't know what's important, how can you protect it? Your controls have to cover the full range of systems. Don't invest lots of money in a control system that does a fantastic job monitoring all of your Windows environments, only to find it doesn't cover the 45% of your environments that run on Solaris and Red Hat. And you need to be evolving your controls with new industry best practice. Keeping up with industry best practice will help ensure you have the best chance of covering the latest threats. If you can identify three areas of weakness in your organization and what actions would have the largest impact, you can make a significant difference in the cyber threat gap. Okay, let's go back to the subject of threat intelligence and a couple of interesting anecdotes. So the first one, um, I was discussing this event with a colleague in the US, and he mentioned he'd moderated the panel of CISOs at a um, FS ISAC summit back in May. One of the questions he asked was, what is the most valuable source of threat intelligence you have today? Um, I think he was really hoping for some controversial responses that would make for an exciting panel discussion. But disappointingly for him, the responses he got seemed consistent across the panel. They all agreed the best source was when a CISO of another company picked up the phone and called them and said, do you know something? we just seen a really sophisticated attack against us, and we're guessing it's probably going to target you next if it hasn't already. Let me tell you what we learned from it and how we dealt with it. A perfect example of peer-to-peer -peer relationships and how they can work extremely well. The second one was um, during a discussion I was having with a large financial services organization, uh, I asked them where they got their best indicators of compromise. I was told the best um, intelligence of that level usually comes from a government organization or agency, which is great. Um, I said, we received details of an attack targeting organizations like ours, and it includes some indicators we should be looking for. So I then had a follow-up question of um, what form did the information arrive in and how did they use it? 
the answer was not surprising, um, but surprising, uh, as you may understand. It comes in an email. I scroll down to the indicators, cut and paste them into another email, and send it to our security operations center, where it is copied into our monitoring solution, which can then scan for any indications of compromise. I've actually heard that story um, more than once in different organizations, in different verticals. Now, it's possibly effective, but definitely not ideal. It's slow and prone to human error. So what is the answer? Well, the answer is automation. MITRE, along with the US Department of Homeland Security, created a standard for sharing threat intelligence in an automated format. It's called Stick and Taxi. You can think of the two standards as analogous to the web. Stix is like HTML and Taxi is like HTTP. So Stix allows you to model everything from a simple IP address and file hashes to very sophisticated advanced persistent threats in common XML format. A security manager told me recently that the most interesting part of Stix for him was the functionality of citing. In a community group, intelligence can be shared, but you don't really know if anyone else has seen the same indicator. With citing, other organizations can raise their hand and very quickly alert the group to the fact that they've seen this indicator also. Taxi is the transport for sharing intelligence across organizations. It supports several dis different sharing models. It has peer-to-peer -peer sharing, so that one organization can share intelligence with another. It has a hub and spoke model of sharing where organizations can send intelligence up to a central hub like an ISAC, and it can then be sent back down to members. And it supports a client server model for sharing where a central source shares intelligence outwards to organizations. Despite the obvious benefits this can bring, adoption and real-world usage is still quite limited. The intelligence is getting shared between organizations in this automated format, but in most organizations, the intelligence is still placed in front of a human threat analyst who has to assess the information and decide what it means to the organization. To make threat intelligence work, we need to automate the whole process, including that last mile. And that's going to mean taking this intelligence all the way to the security controls, not just into the organization. So let's talk about the idea of connecting intelligence to existing controls. Monitoring systems are everywhere. So you're probably already seeing the indicators that something bad is happening. The problem we come across time and time again is not we don't have enough visibility, it's we have too much visibility. An organization will be receiving reams of data relating to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of events every day. Even after correlation, the analyst is having to assess hundreds or possibly thousands of events of interest to decide whether they are significant to the organization. By adding your intelligence feeds into your controls, you can better discriminate the good from the bad letting you more easily pick out the bad changes and act on them much more quickly. This is the value you get when receiving intelligence via an automated format like Sticks and Taxi and getting your security controls to be able to directly consume that content. So let's go back to the cyber threat gap and see what the impact of this connection of intelligence to your controls means. If we can reduce the time taken by a human analyst to sort bad and good changes that are happening within your environment, then we are speeding up and improving the effectiveness of breach detection, and therefore, we're closing the threat detection gap. One of our customers um, was implement, uh, implementing exactly this kind of direct connection of threat intelligence to their security controls. And I asked them about the impact it would have for them. The security manager said, the amount of changes 
we have to deal with on a daily basis is mind-blowing. And to be presented with the known identifiable bad changes first, front and center is absolutely huge for us. So when we identify a breach, how does threat intelligence help close down the response gap? It goes back to the fundamental challenge of incident response which is identifying just how broad the scope of the breach is. We now have to take a look at the broader set of systems and work out how far the compromise may have spread. Forensics from the identified breach device can be used to create indicators, allowing us to do more extensive scans of our enterprise. Being able to quickly use and share indicators of compromise across large groups of organizations will have a huge impact on the reduction of the, re of the threat response gap. When we discuss security these days, a lot of what we discuss is bad news. So let me share with you a few items that I think are good and show how things are getting better. A few statistics to note here. The evasive malware that has increased by 2,000% in the last year. Sandboxing technology has proved to be effective on average 97.5% of the time. The rapid pace that hackers are able to infiltrate and start siphoning data from our systems, if we can deliver advanced malware to these sandboxes, network vendors are all creating integration points so that the behavior of the malware can be automatically turned into blocking rules, preventing command and control or the exfiltration of data. And those rules can be in place across firewalls worldwide within 30 minutes of the first instance of the malware being detected. The challenge we often encounter isn't that this connection between sandboxes and network prevention doesn't work. It's that quite often it's only deployed at the point where our networks connect to the internet. And so it lacks visibility of what's happening across the rest of our systems. I think we all know there are multiple routes by which malware can gain access into our networks. It isn't just served to us via a web page or email. But if we can start to connect systems monitoring together with network protection and sandboxing technology, we can start to provide even better holistic protection across the entire infrastructure. So for instance, if we review the rather simplistic workflow diagram, we see that Tripwire Enterprise has identified a new binary that may have been dropped onto one of your critical servers. It can send a copy of the file or the hash um, up to the analytics to either a cloud or appliance-based sandbox. When a threat is detected, a new indicator of compromise is sent back to the Tripwire Enterprise. Now, Tripwire Enterprise can now use this to create a new rule that it can uh, send out in a scan to all monitored devices um, looking for existence of this um, binary file. At the same time, an updated prevention rule can be created and installed on all of your next generation firewalls to ensure that any future attempts uh, to put this binary through are blocked. Now, as I said, it's a pretty simplistic view, but I think it demonstrates the advantages of connecting intelligence to our controls. We also talked about the value of threat intelligence when connected to controls, but it's only as good as the intelligence we receive. The value of intelligence grows as the community grows in strength, but currently only about 25% of organizations are sharing intelligence back out to the community. We need to do better. There is a network effect that our industry isn't taking enough advantage of yet. The odds are, most of the time, your organization is not going to be the first um, targeted by an attack, but rather third, fourth, fifth, hundredth, whatever. If you are the first, 
and you share what is happening with your peers and they do the same for you, we will all be better prepared to detect and respond to these threats. Whether it's the technology, regulation or resources that is holding us back, we all need to do better going forward. Okay, to sum things up, here are three key things to take away from today. There are lots of sources of intelligence out there. Make sure your organization is taking maximum advantage wherever and whenever possible. It is critical that threat intelligence can be consumed in an automated way and that you don't just let it sit with an analyst. Actively work to connect it to your existing security controls. If your intelligence sources aren't delivering content via sticks and taxi, ask them to do so. It's ironic that the government agencies sending intelligence in emails are part of the same governments that created the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Partnership and the standards to stop sending intelligence via emails, i.e. sticks and taxi. Finally, make sure you nurture the peer-to-peer -peer relationships that encourage information sharing. The whole community benefits when you share intelligence. Thank you very much for giving up your time to listen to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.